Hello and welcome to the Carblue Podcast. For John and I, it's the Sunday show, but this is coming out on Monday morning. John, it's a lovely Sunday morning here in Kidderminster. The sun is shining. I've got coffee in my hand. Villa, I've got three points. It's all rosy, isn't it, at the moment? It is all rosy, yeah. Another huge win yesterday. Every win will feel huge at the moment. You know, yeah. The final three months of the season. But yeah, yesterday, like last weekend, it felt even more important considering other results or... I suppose other result. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, it's um, you know three points, but it almost felt like more in a weird way because I remember when Villa lost to United on Boxing Day, but then the following week or a few days later, wherever it may have been, um, we beat Burnley and United lost to Forest at, at the City Ground, and that almost felt like okay, so the defeat to United is kind of out the window now. It almost doesn't. Not that it doesn't matter, but we've kind of you know essentially. As if it never happened, right? Mm. So um, I feel like our win against um, Forest uh, yesterday or on Saturday, and then United losing to Fulham at home, that almost eradicates their win over us again. So we're kind of in the same position as what we were if we didn't play them in, in a weird way. And I know, mm. you know, it's so frustrating that we lost them twice, um, and we could have an even bigger gap right now. But they've basically blown their opportunity to kind of make use of their wins against us. Um, which is a good thing. So, yeah, eight points plus goal difference. We're in a really good position now to um, head into the final, I say final 12 games this season. It's still a long way to go, but you are kind of looking at it now and thinking, well, if we win this amount, then we'll, you know, probably get Champions League, that sort of stuff. But we can now look at that as a situation of, well, I don't know, if we win half the games, we should be able to get it. And that's, you know, we can now look at targets, I think. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, really good, uh, really good win. Yeah, we will have a look at some of those targets in a second. The the bulk of today's show, as it always is every week, is full of questions from the audience as well, and we'll, we'll get into those in a second. Just as a, an FYI for people maybe watching this, John, you're a little bit fidgety because you literally sat on the floor <laughs> for this one because you're at your, your mum and dad's house. So uh, yeah. that is why you look a little bit... You can tell like you're playing with your legs because you're on the floor and you're stretching and stuff. Yeah, I was um, actually scratching my foot. So <laughs> oh, yeah. I knew you were up to something. I could see it. I've been on the floor for the last few podcasts, to be fair. You probably just didn't realise. Oh, I did not realise, no. Do you want me to give um, you a of the office? Go Good on time. then. Yeah, why not? Why not? Oh, well, let's see what you see what you see, see what you're working with. <laughs> uh, where, what is your laptop on? A little turntable? No, just on a seat. I should be sitting on the seat, but then I have nothing to put it on. So <laughs> it's a crazy setup. Before we get into questions, I was awoken, not by you, John, but I woke up early this morning with a little one, as always, uh, to four voice notes from yourself sent to me at 2 a.m. I've just finished my shift and I've just been thinking, uh, talking about Man United and <laughs> basically how they're not going to get Champions League ahead of us. Well, uh, We will get into the specifics yeah. of points and then how many games to win and all that kind of stuff, but what was going on last night for you to be sending me those at, at 2 in the morning? Basically, I did the maths and um, I'm feeling you confident. the numbers. I think, yeah, I, I think, I don't know, I probably come across, across sorry, quite negative on most podcasts, so I'm trying to change that. Um, but I think it's just because I'm quite, I don't know, I'm very anxious about the rest of the season still. But yesterday has given us just a huge opportunity now. Luton, and every game is a big game, I said it like two minutes ago, but if we can beat Luton, I think we have a huge chance of doing it then. And I know we have a big chance now, right, but United go to City on Sunday. And don't get me wrong, we could... Draw to Luton and United could beat City because that's just the way things go sometimes with Man United. But, you know, if we can go to Kenilworth Road and win the game, because I think, you know, we can. Yes, Luton are uh, good for Luton with no disrespect, but they are still are they third bottom at the moment, I think. I think they're in the relegation, in the relegation zone. If they're not, it might be a point or something out. Uh, um, yeah, they're 18th, 20 points. They're, they're a point from safety. Yeah, so Villa should be going there and winning the game. And that's not disrespectful to say. If we have aspirations to get in the top four, you know, if we were going to Everton, we'd want to win the game. If we were going to Forest, we'd want to win the game. So Luton shouldn't be any different, even though they've yeah. got, um, well, they're doing well for Luton, as I say. And I like Rob Edwards a lot. I think they've got some good players, Adebayo, Carlton Morris, they can cause us problems. But if we can, yeah, so I'm going on now. But if we can beat Luton, we would then have to win five of our last 11 to get 70 points. And 70 points is usually the benchmark for fourth, but we're also factoring in fifth now because there is a high probability mm. that fifth place gets... Um, gets Champions League unless like a few, quite a few things happen in terms of like Freiburg would have to beat West Ham, Bayern would have to go to pretty much like the semi final or something, and City would have to get knocked out, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, five wins out of 11 would require 70 points for Villa if we were to beat Luton. 
United, if that was to happen, would then have to win nine of their last 11, which I'm not it's trying to tell. It's challenging form, isn't that's, it? Surely that doesn't happen. I mean, they've only won, I don't know, maybe four in a row max this season. Um, they'd have to do that and then win like five. They've won 14 all season. If you, you know, you're saying they'd lose against City, we win against Luton. From that scenario there, if Villa get to 70 with five wins, Man United to get to that level would have to win nine from 11. Yeah. Uh, forget about jinx and whatever. That's not happening. It right, simply exactly. is not happening. Man United is terrible. Why, yeah, and but that's why Luton now is like, a, okay, like we've got ourselves in a great position because we've beaten Fulham, we've beaten Forest, but we've also been helped by United losing to Fulham. But if we go to Luton, knowing that, okay, if we just do our job here, win the game, we can then watch United play City, you know, even if they drop points, that's good. You know, they don't even have to lose, even if they were to draw, that, you know, great, we've gained points. I just feel like there's so much riding on that now. Not to apply any pressure because, I mean, there'll be some quotes that will already be out by now. Basically, Leon Bailey saying that Villa aren't looking behind, they're looking forward. So they're not even mm. feeling any pressure about teams below like I am, or I don't know if anyone else is, but I'm looking at Man United and thinking, right, how many points can we get ahead of them and all that sort of stuff. But Bailey's doesn't, um, <laughs> he's not even looking. I, to be fair, he said uh, in the mix zone as well that he didn't even know that United lost the game. He, he said it was like the first time he knew. He was like, oh, okay, well, that helps. Um, but I almost get the vibe that they don't, or at least the vibe that they give off is that they don't care about what's happening beneath and they're only looking ahead and focusing on themselves. Um, so, yeah, if we were to beat Luton, I just feel like then it's in our hands then. Like, I don't know it's in our hands now, but it really is then. You know, five wins out of 11 is still you know, pretty challenging, to be fair, considering our fixture list, in my opinion. But we wouldn't even have to win five out of 11. That just basically guarantees it. We might only have to win four and then United yeah, yeah. win eight out of the last yeah. 11. Like that is... United really would have to go on some remarkable run um, to get that. But, you know, we want to finish fourth still, don't we? We want to have it, you know, absolutely nailed on. We are in the top four. We want to beat Spurs, um, all that sort if we, of stuff. If we, if we do what we're saying about Luton and Man United dropping points against City and then we beat Spurs the following weekend, not only is fifth pretty much a guarantee, but we'd also then be talking about we're really comfortable for fourth as well. And yeah. I'm not bothered whether fifth gets the extra Champions League spot if Villa finished fourth. Oh, no, oh, I don't know. Rather it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, the only thing with our fixture list is that we have to go to City, we have to go to Arsenal. And I know we're not, go, you know, we're going to go there and we might get something, but those are two games that we will probably drop points in, if not both. Um, Brighton away, I think, will be tough. West Ham away could be difficult. I don't know. Wolves at home will be difficult. Liverpool at home will be difficult. You know, I do think we have a tough run, but if we can put ourselves in a position where we know that we only have to do four out of five, so four or five out of eleven or something, we can just chip it. You know, go into you could win one, games. lose two for the rest of the season, and still do enough. We could win five of our last six home games, which is Brentford, Wolves, Chelsea, Bournemouth, Liverpool. ignoring Liverpool, Tottenham. If we win those games, then we would have Champions League pretty much sewn up. I think before even playing Liverpool, which obviously will be the full game because they'll probably be going for the league. I don't know. Um, hopefully they won't be, and we can kind of ruin Klopp's final away game. But yeah, it's just that Luton game for me now is just huge because um, it would really put... I know we've got daylight now, but it would give us the kind of comfort of, OK, we know that we've just got to do this now. Like It's kind of on a plate of you just got to win four or five. I think it's interesting to take a little bit of a... to take that Villa bias away from it a little bit every so often, that if this was... Newcastle is the perfect example last year. If you were looking at another club and exactly the same reference points that Villa are now, where they are in the league, what the points gap is, what they've just done over Man United in terms of opening up an eight-point gap again. They play Spurs soon. They've got a manager like Unai Emery. They've got a striker like Watkins, a midfielder like Douglas Luiz, all those things. If that was a Newcastle or Brighton or West Ham doing exactly the same thing, you would all look at that and go, they'll finish in the top four. And you wouldn't even think twice about it. So you think they're in a brilliant position. They've got all the tools to do it. It's only because we put that kind of anxiety onto it as fans of the club that you think, oh, this is all going to go wrong because it usually does go wrong for Villa. I don't think that's the case anymore under Emery. We, is it over 100 points now in, in the league for him since he's been here? Well, yeah, it was 98 out of 150. So, yeah, you're on 101 now. It's some going, isn't it, in a, in a season and a bit? What you say they're done about the kind of you know, anyone else would tip us for top five, you know, absolutely, or they'd put the house on it or whatever. But I, I think that is right, though. Like, we don't have the experience of doing it, which I do think counts as something. But as I said earlier, Leon, ba Leon Bailey, maybe it's just Bailey, I don't know, but probably the rest of the squad, they're not feeling the pressure. They've had so many injuries, they could have easily kind of used that as an excuse. But, you know, Emery won't, and he kind of sets the tone. I'm sure other managers will use that as an excuse. 
and then they'd probably be six points down on what they should be, you know, or what Villa are. So yeah, it is very exciting. It's just that we haven't been in this position before, not in my lifetime anyway. Um, and those players haven't either. So it's, you know, if in the last six games, we still need to win two out of six or whatever it may be, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but then what pressure does that bring? Are we in the semi-final? That sort of stuff. That's all still mm. to come. Yeah. So if we can just treat Luton as a, you know, I said before, we've got 13 cup finals, now we've got 12, but we can make it like six cup finals if you, if you get one <laughs> yeah. because we beat Luton, great. Now United have to win nine out of 11 if they lose to City. Then we'd have, you know, got to playing Tottenham at home, you, you know, you're very confident, all that sort of stuff. So it's, um, yeah, we can make our job a lot easier is what I'm trying to say, but I just don't think it'll be that easy. I think we'll no. have to towards the end of the season, which will be okay as long as we do it. Um, mm. But we can kind of save ourselves some drama. I think that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, I agree. I think it'll be interesting to look back on how this you know, remaining period of the season pan- panned out come the end of the season. That I'm not saying that we will just get Champions League by default, that we don't have to do our own job because, like you say, we still need to win. But obviously, it's games like we still have to do that ourselves, of course. I think all this kind of stress about will they, will not know in terms of Man United... I don't think we'll be a factor at the end of the season. I don't think Man United have got enough to even to even challenge us. Some of the stuff I was hearing yesterday about their game, they've been awful. And we saw in the games against us, even you know, we played well against them in the first half at Old Trafford. We played well in in all the game at Villa Park uh, and deserved to win. The fact that we've give, gifted them six points and they're still eight points behind us. I'll just take those six points off them and they're not even on 40 points yet. They're a mid-table side, overachieving massively just because they, they scrape these wins by... Scoring in the 96th minute with Tom there coming up out of nowhere, someone they wanted to get rid of. Hamaguire scoring goals, someone they wanted to get rid of. They're a poorly coached team. Like, if it's not Man United and what that means is like, oh, they always get decisions, they always score late. Just look at them as a irrelevant mid table club. Why are we bothered about them? I don't think they'll do enough to even get near us. Um, yeah, it is all just experience, though. Like, I, again, in my 23 years on this, 24 years on this planet, I've I only had bad experiences by Man United and I've only been stung. <laughs> I've only been stung when even when it looks like, you know, how many times have, been, have we been tuning up against them, for example, and blowing it, you know, yeah, that sort I of know. stuff. I don't want to talk too much about them or play them down too much because we, we, you just know what happens. Like, we've seen that script before sort of thing. If we just concentrate on our own thing, though, we know that we've got it in the bag. If we go to Kenilworth, Kenilworth Road and win, can watch hopefully Man City beat United. Goodness me, what a position. Like, it, it's, it's on a plate for us then. We've still got difficult games, but as I say, you can pinpoint four or five games. If you win them, you've got you've got top five. You've got Champions League. Again, top five isn't guaranteed, but you likely. Should we talk about that? Yeah, what, yeah. what it means for, for this extra position? Because there's still some confusion I see week yeah. in, week out when we ask for questions for Q&A. What actually means? Why, why, why is there even an extra slot to begin with? How does one get into that? Why do we need Man City to go far in the Champions League for fifth place to open up? Or why, you know, what, what, what do we need to happen? Can you explain that a little bit for those that maybe aren't sure? Italy and Germany um, have the top two places at the moment, but that is kind of because Germany. I mean, Italy should get it, but Germany, the team that England should be toppling, um, Germany have had teams play in the qualifying, uh, so the um, the knockout rounds of the Europa League and the Conference League, which gives them the opportunity to get points, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a start. But then they've had Frankfurt go out, for example. Freiburg nearly went out. Um, they just about scraped through against Lons, but then they'll be playing West Ham. So that... Freiburg West Ham game is huge because um, if West Ham go through, Freiburg are out, and then all of a sudden Germany have, I think it's only Leverkusen and Bayern Munich. Mm. They may have another, I'm not totally sure, but England, they've got uh, Brighton, West Ham, Villa, Arsenal, Man City. And I know Arsenal lost to Porto, which wasn't good for the coefficient. I mean, my partner's a Porto fan, and I'm going to the game at the Emirates, so I, I want Porto to win, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a win win for me, I suppose, <laughs> in, in a kind of a roundabout way. Um, so basically, England are projected to get to the second place. I think it's um, something like 80 to 84 percent is what the kind of statistics and the um, data scientists, all that sort of stuff, what, what they're saying. And they've kind of coded the numbers and whatever. I do think you get more points or something along those lines the later you go in the competition. I think that it's something to do with that, um, which means that those qualifying grounds don't count for like too much, sorry, knockout rounds. Um, so, yeah, England are still in a very good position. It's just that only Man City and Arsenal have played one uh, leg of their ties. Mm, Brighton haven't yeah. played, Villa haven't played, West Ham haven't played. Um, 
Arsenal, sorry, Liverpool as well. We forget Liverpool. Liverpool are there as well. So we have lots of teams, teams that should go far. And then, as I say, Germany have got only kind of a handful. And I mean, if you look at Bayern Munich, yes, they might beat Lazio. But I think if they came up against a half decent team in the next round, they'd probably get knocked out. And I think two will stay until the end of the season, if I'm not mistaken, which again probably helps the coefficient. England are in a very strong place still. Um, but it won't be kind of like clear until about the quarterfinal stage because that's when everyone would have played a game. Mm. Uh, and England, as I say, should have teams in there. Uh, West Ham should be beating Freiburg, really. Villa obviously should be beating Ajax. And as I should be, that's, you know, hopeful more than anything. Um, <laughs> Roma play Brighton, which is difficult for Brighton, but I think they're capable of beating them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Man City play Copenhagen, they should win that. Arsenal should be beating Porto, really, as well. So, um, yeah, Liverpool have Carabag too, so that, that's probably two wins there. So, th- there's a lot of points and wins there up for grabs. So then you're looking at quarterfinals, then semifinals and finals across the three different competitions. But Germany don't have that many teams and they're not as populated in the competition. So, um, mm. yeah, basically, it's likely you just got to kind of trust the uh, the stats people that they've, as I say, they've done the numbers correctly. <laughs> yeah, we've said a long time, haven't we, that we'll, it'll all be clear by the end of the season. And obviously, that goes without saying by the end of the season we will know for certain but if all the German sides go out in the next round and all the English sides continue to go further we'll know before the end of the season there's a probability yeah like you've got the international break in March I think after then um, kind of April time you'd be able to tell then well if it'll it'll be the case of well if Villa get to a semi-final and Liverpool get to a semi-final, Man City get to a semi-final, then they should be... Do you know what I mean? It's Yeah, so then you'd be going, oh, we're five points clear of... No, nine points clear of sixth. Like we're guaranteed to finish fifth almost mathematically and fifth is definitely Champions League. Yes, then we'll, you can kind of go, well, now we can focus on the Conference League because we've, we've yeah. kind of wrapped it up. We, we know yeah. we know where we're going to be. Yeah, I think come May, you'll know the situation of, all right, Villa need to win this amount of games for Champions League or they need to do this for Champions League. Oh, sorry, top five. And then you'll flip it and say, well... Whereas uh, England in the coefficient, okay, so as long as by Leverkusen um, don't win the Europa League and these things happen, do you know? What I mean? So it's um, yeah, both things at the moment are likely. Let's just say that. Yeah. So it's um, yeah, positive situation. All right, let's get into some viewer questions then. Uh, first of all, from Sam Ty, he says, "Can any of you lot play centre half?" <laughs> I saw that. I played as a centre half when I was uh, like six till about eight. Don't know, go. Why. don't know why. And that is my only contribution to uh, Sam's answer. So, no. I used to love heading balls away on the playground, <laughs> basically. When we'd play at lunchtime and stuff, I would always play at the back and just whack balls away with my big head. So, when we do our predicted 11 for Luton on Friday, it might be you and me playing centre-half. Uh, can I you, you know when you say in the playground, were you allowed a football in the playground? Yeah, I'm talking, I'm talking high school. There was like an Astro turf pitch at my high school and you could go out yeah. at lunchtime and play football, yeah. We didn't get that. We we could only use like a tennis ball. Oh um, God, so what's happened to this country? It was good to kind of improve your technical ability with the tennis ball. <laughs> um, no, it's good times still, but uh, yeah, we couldn't use a football because I presume like back in the day you'd probably get you know like year eleven is just slamming like a mitre ball into year yeah, seven. That like, did happen, yeah, yeah, good times. Which I was great. Great, like bullying, so we don't condone that. No, we don't condone it, but it was great times back then, wasn't it? it really, was a different time. Uh, also on centre half, Dan asks if Chambers had, if Chambers had gone in the January transfer window, or God forbid we get another injury, who even plays centre half? Yeah, I presume Matty Cash would go centre back, and then Kessler would come on as a right back. I think that is the only option we had. I don't think you can put midfield there because any youth players. Tim could potentially be put there for his physicality, but he's never played the position at least at senior level. It would have to be cash, I think, because then you've got to look at what happens across the rest of the team. I don't think you can take out midfielders because that's just a, you know, why would you bring McGinn out when he was so good? Obviously, Louise isn't going to be playing there. So yeah, I think cash would have gone centre back and then Kessler right back. I don't think you could have done it with the left back. I mean, Luca Dean, to be fair, um, I hear he's actually played centre back at some points in his career. Okay. So yeah, but again, Where? It's- when? Uh, I don't actually know. I don't remember playing centre half for Everton. Might have been no, it wasn't Everton. It might have been Barcelona or PSG. Um, I don't mean like for a prolonged period. I was just told that he's played there um, okay. previously. I, again, I don't know for how long. I haven't really looked into it, but that was kind of a solution. Uh, someone said a couple of weeks ago, like if um, if Villa are struggling with more injuries, then Luca Dean has played at centre back before. But well, that's the uh, left back issue. Sorry, left sided issue. Unless it's Longley gets injured, you know. So. Um, <laughs> 
it's not a good situation, basically, if we were to get another centre-back injured. What do we know about Pau Torres as of this morning? A slight pain yesterday. with was talk of a scan as well. I think I saw you tweet. Is that correct? Which is, yeah, which is just uh, normal. That wasn't kind normal, of... Scan, yeah, yeah. yeah you, any injury, any small pain, apart from like cramp, you just get it scanned. Because you don't know what... You know, you need to look inside the muscle sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's a small pain in his in, in the back of his leg. So I, I don't, I'm not going to say which muscle because I don't know and I don't want to guess. And Emery said that it was kind of like he was feeling it kind of progressively worse during the half. Um, so I'm going to, I shouldn't guess, but I guess it's like a, some sort of strain, like a small strain. But Emery did say it's hopefully it's not actually an injury. Emery has said before stuff like, oh, hopefully um, it's not bad or, you know, whatever it may be. And it turns out to be a couple of weeks, you know, which... I guess isn't too bad for some injuries, but um, Torres, he didn't say that. He just said, hopefully it's not an injury. So, you know, you're just hoping he's, I mean, it was a precaution, but yeah, hopefully with a couple of days rest, because he will be resting now for a few days, he can kind of fix up for um, Luton at the weekend. That would be my hope. Mm. Uh, and as I say, it was definitely a precaution because Emery was saying that he's, he basically wasn't uh, willing to take a risk on him. And to be honest, I wonder if he gave word to the bench, basically, I don't know, after Villa's third goal, maybe, and just said, like, I'm kind of feeling something, I don't know. Um, and then we had to make the change at half-time anyway, because I do think we were very vulnerable, to be honest, at the point of Forrest's uh, goal, because then as soon as he came off, we were, um, yeah, like, back against the wall sort of thing. We were under the cosh, that goal from mm. Bay was crucial. I don't think we would have, well, we might have won the game, you know, but, um, yeah, we were under it for a long period of time. So, yeah, hopefully Torres is okay for Luton. We'll get an update. <clears throat> on Friday from memory about that. Um, but yeah, not like a big concern, but you don't want him to miss any game, really, because you, we've uh, seen what happens when he's not playing. We're, we're like 10, 20 yards back from where we're supposed to be when we defend, when we're on the ball. So like his influence is just crazy. It is a bit of a worry that he's getting these little knocks. And I know the ankle one was a contact injury. Um, but yeah, you, you wrap him in cotton wool. Cotton wool? Bubble wrap. Not- yeah, can you take that out, please? <laughs> I think no, you can say cotton wool. I think that is a saying. Cotton wool, yeah. Bubble wrap. I don't know where I was going there. No, I think it is cotton wool. You know, I think you've, yeah. I think you've, mis- I think you've doubted yourself. Wrap me in cotton wool. I think that is the phrase. Yeah, but then when you say bubble wrap, it's throwing me off. Um, <laughs> do, do both. <laughs> Uh, another question we mentioned Luca Dean James asks did anyone else see Unai Emery ranting at Luca Dean on the subs bench and what was all that about I didn't see this at the time but I've seen a clip of it since on Twitter which I can't play on the podcast obviously for copyright purposes but it's it's funny it looks like it was maybe a joke <laughs> they found it funny <laughs> it wasn't shouting at him literally it was it was asked about in the press conference and he just said like very obviously uh, I was just telling him uh, about tactics that his teammates were doing, so I presume Moreno. And he probably saw something that he didn't like from Moreno, and I presume that was the other side of the pitch, so he couldn't like bark at Moreno, so he pro- probably thought, oh, I'll vent my anger at Luca Dean <laughs> and tell him, you know, don't do that, basically. Yeah, I was just laughing at Luca Dean's face because he was kind of like saying, me, what? <laughs> like, what? Yeah, it looked like he was smirking. It looked like it was, you know, <laughs> it was kind of a bit of a confusion, but also a couple of, from like the bench, a couple of like rice smiles, a bit like, yeah, oh, yeah. we all know there's nothing going on here. I love the idea that like, Mid game, you know, it's not enough for him to coach his start 11, he's got to coach the bench as well. Yeah, yeah. no, no, it's no. um, anyone can get it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> anyone can get it when he knows on the touchline. Um, that was the most animated I've seen him to be fair for a while. Villa were quite sloppy and not to nitpick and be like particularly negative, but I, I don't think that was like by a long way one of the best performances of the season. I don't know, they scored four goals, but. Gave the ball away quite cheaply in their own defensive third. Torres did probably the first time this season. Um, no, it wasn't actually. He's done it a few times at the start, but uh, not for a while. Longley had a little moment. You know, just little Ramsey played a square ball that was intercepted by uh, hudson Adoy, which uh, cashed as well to recover from. Like, there were just a few moments where we just weren't particularly, like, I don't know, um, where it was a lapse of concentration. or We're tuning up against Forest. We should be able to coast this. I, that's those lapses will go punish and they did in the end you know Forrest scored two goals and all of a sudden we were like okay well they're in the game and Alanga probably should have scored to make it free all mm, yeah. the game completely changes so we we have to manage games I say better than what we did because in the end we won 4-2 but against better opposition we won't be able to do that and to be fair I don't think we would I think it was a situation of right we're tuning up 
I think even the crowd probably thought, okay, this is a bit of a procession at this point, you know, fantastic, we're two nil up, um, but we can just relax and watch the team now. And it kind of seeped onto the pitch, I thought. And I think mm, that's yeah, why it was animated because it was like, you no, know, like one set piece and they score from, and, and they did, completely changes the second half and they get an early goal. And, you know, we've put ourselves in that position. So it could have been a different game. Villa still played very well. And the goals they scored were excellent. Um, maybe I'm looking kind of, I don't know, per, for perfection, but... I do think we were a bit sloppy at times and that is kind of uncharacteristic. So it's not like a concern. It's just the, the only sort of negative about the game, I thought. I'm going to talk about Leon Bailey next, giving his own little segment. There's a couple of questions about him. So I'm going to do them all in one and then we'll discuss him afterwards. First of all, Sweet Sonics asks, um, Leon Bailey reminds me of both Prime Grealish and Ashley Young. Just based on this season, would you put him at that level? And incidentally, Rob also said, is Bailey reaching Ashley Young levels? And thirdly, David says, let's talk about how much Unai Emery has improved Leon Bailey, not just in terms of goal contributions, but how willing he is to take on defenders 1v1. Also, he's improved in terms of his tracking back. Emery has really extracted value from what we paid Leverkusen. Bailey's been unbelievable this season, has he, in terms of his, his contribution. That's why you're laughing. <laughs> it's like, oh, but, I've like, so butchered that question for about five minutes and I'm about to edit it all out. Yeah, maybe. I'm laughing in kind of like um, like joy about Leon Bailey, like genuinely. Like, there's nothing more that I like when a winger just stands an opponent up and beats him like nine mm-hmm. times out of ten. And that's Bailey at the moment. Like, he's, I don't have to put this without like, over egging it, but. He's playing as like one of the best wings in the world at the moment. He is. Well, I was going to ask yeah. you that. Did you watch the podcast last night at the post match? Uh, I watched twenty minutes of it on the train. I okay, we I... spoke about Bailey probably after that. To be honest, I, and I asked think... Matt whether he was one of the best right sided forwards in the league at the moment. So obviously you've got Salah. That's like the obvious answer is yeah. one of the best, world class, etc. Yeah, Leon Bailey is one of the best right wingers in the Premier League this season. And then yeah. by definition, if he's one of the best in the Premier League, that yeah, makes yeah. him one of the best across the world. Yeah, yeah. No, he is it, kind of speechless about him again. Never good for a podcast, but he stands his opponent up, beats him, skins him, and lays it on a plate for his uh, teammate. Like, he makes it look really easy now. And we know in the last two years it hasn't been that easy for Bailey. Mm. But yeah, yeah. He's playing with so much confidence and he's almost impossible to play against. And I keep thinking about, and again, this might be overselling it again. I don't know, but like Iron Robin, right? You know exactly what he's doing all the time. He's quick. He wants to get on his left foot. He barely uses his right foot. And to be fair, barely uses his right foot more than Robin did. But is that kind of ilk? And you're thinking like, this, what winger would you swap him with in world football right now? I'll throw a name to you. Something that I saw on social media yesterday, I think it was TNT Sports were tweeting it, about Saka scoring against Newcastle. And that, it was like, that, that, is a, that is a world-class finish, generational talent, blah, blah, blah. Would you rather have Saka or Bailey? Right now, I wouldn't swap Saka for Bailey, no? I, j- no, I, wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'm glad you brought Saka up because that's the one I forgot. I was thinking of players like Phil Foden, which is difficult, very different player to Bailey, you know, as term- in terms of right-sided players. But I wouldn't swap. I'm not saying Bailey's a better player than Saka. Like, that's not, I'm not going to like compare everybody. Um, but would I swap him? No, I wouldn't. Like the- He's playing out of his skin. Like he's. I don't want to say I'm like amazed because Bailey was always a good player. Like he was very hit and miss in terms of his injuries. He wasn't always consistent, but he's taken on a new level. Like he's playing completely different to where he was. But like I just never expected this level. I really didn't. And no, we yeah. are to say one of the best wings in world football right now. Like we absolutely do. We have one of the best strikers as well. Like it's it's not crazy to say because we are you know at the moment fourth in the Premier League. You know we're going to have good players, right? And a lot of them are injured at the moment. But Bailey. Just wow. Like every time he touches the ball, something happens. It's And that was the effect that Grealish had. It was always the case of, um, you know, switch the ball to Grealish because he's going to create something even if he gets, you know, I hate to say it, but like the pre-assist, you know what I mean? Because he, he, he makes things happen. He creates space. And Bailey's similar. As soon as he gets the ball on that right side, defenders, it, they're, they're scared. They, they don't know where to look and where to turn. Marvellous play. And I don't even think he expected this level. I know he said, as I say, the quotes on Birmingham Live, if you want to read them, um, he said that he knows he can, you know, play to this level, and it was all about kind of just getting it out of himself, you know, that sort of thing. But he's playing like, you know, just wow! Like I, I can't sort of talk highly enough of it. It's, as I say, when you look at Grealish, it's that effect right now for me. So the, the question about Grealish and um, Ashley Young, I don't remember how I felt when Ashley Young was on the mm-hmm. wing. In terms of, I know I remember a lot of how he played, and he was my favourite player for years before Jack. So um, 
I don't quite remember exactly what Young was in terms of how I felt when he had the ball and how he affected games. I know it was good, but I think it's different because we were quite like a counter-attacking team. Same mm-hmm. as really, we were, you know, rarely dominated games under Dean Smith because of the level of the other players. Um, but this time, you know, we're playing against usually anyway a lower block, but Bailey's still getting all the joy. And on the counter-attack, it's obviously devastating. Um, Musa Diaby can't really get a game at the moment. Um, I don't think that's all because of Bailey. I think he can play with him at points, but I can't speak highly enough for Bailey. You, just watching him is an absolute joy at the moment. He's um, a tremendous player and what a season. We've got him down as well on a, on a new deal, of course. So, um, yeah, I don't doubt there's, there would have probably been interest as well because you look at him and you think, well, who is better than Bailey on, you know, as a winger at the moment? Is Saka better in terms of a player? I don't know, maybe. Maybe his ceiling is higher. But this mm. season, has all been better. I don't think so. Um, Salah is probably on par, really, in terms of... <laughs> Out, that's, that's crazy, isn't it? it Given is. like again some of the context around the conversation of Bailey and, and why it kind of feels so good to see him doing what he's doing, yeah. is because we saw the previous two seasons where he didn't look anywhere near this level. We thought yeah. kind of wasted our money a little bit. He's rarely fit enough. He's not consistent enough. If an offer came in for twenty million, you'd probably go, "Oh, go on, then I'd take it and let's try something else." The fact that we're now going, you might be on a par with Salah. That's madness. Yeah, well, and I must clarify, I don't mean in terms of his literal output or his, maybe he's maybe as, as good a player. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying the way he's playing, you know, it's, it's mad. Like, we're just swapping for Salah, I don't know, like in a poll, that most people might say yes, but then there'll be a lot of saying no. Like, genuine, I feel <laughs> he's been that good this season. Like, for the last 12 games of the season, would you swap Salah for Bailey, Villa fans? I honestly think quite a few would say no. And I know that's mental, but I am factoring in, like, Salah's fitness and all that sort of stuff. Okay, you know? yeah. Bailey knows what he's doing at the moment. He is a fixture in that eleven. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, why would you swap him to bring someone else in that isn't so adept at playing in this system? Do you know what I mean? He's, he's just perfect right now, and hopefully that can continue. And I don't see any reason why not. It's just a sensational season for him, and yeah, every time he touches the ball, something something happens, and it's um, mm. yeah, remarkable. Next up, John, we're going to talk about the WhatsApp community. We it's back, everybody. Uh, something that we launched, I don't know what, six weeks ago or something, and it was up for two days and then got dropped because of whatever reason. Who knows? Uh, you had to set up a new account so everyone who previously had followed it or subscribed, or whatever the word is, have to kind of redo that and follow a link. The link to that will be in the podcast description. So if you scroll down on YouTube, Spotify, <laughs> Apple Podcasts, whatever, where all the description is, it says Dan and John talk about Body Way Bar. There was a link down there to the WhatsApp community. It's free to join. It's not full of spam. I kind of experienced it yesterday for the first time as a fan because you did it during the game. When I'm coming back on the way back, it's like John Townley's play ratings. Click here to read them. I was like, convenient, easy, straight to my phone. I was like, that's that's the use, that's the use case of why we do it. The podcast dropped through as we were on air. So people, like the, as we were live yesterday, you tweeted it out and the view count went up straight away. That People had seen oh, it, clicked on it and came and watched it. We wanted. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's exactly what we want, right? So there is also, for those that are watching on YouTube specifically, there will be a QR code on screen. I don't know where yet. On John's forehead, let's say. I'm going to put it on John's forehead now. Click there, scan it on your phone, and it will pop up straight to WhatsApp. You can join the community. So that's how you do it. John, why should people do it? What will they be getting if they, if they join up to this community? Can you set the barcode off my head now? Yeah, get rid of it now. It's gone. Yeah, so as Dan said, it's basically a service. It's obviously completely free. Um, I don't know if anyone's aware, but WhatsApp have a feature called Communities where um, you basically just join. It's not a kind of page where you can message other people and all of your details and stuff won't be seen by anyone. That's a kind of a, kind of a key thing. Um, and basically, you will just receive uh, text messages in terms of when we post, not everything that goes on Birmingham Live. There we go. Yeah, that's a good uh, a good example from Dan. As the podcast, as at the moment, yeah, there's the podcast. <laughs> oh my god! You know, for example, on a match day, it will be the case of you know, here's the live blog, here's the play ratings, here's what Emery said, here's every word he said, here's the update on Torres, all that stuff, and it'll be basically just sent to you as a text message. Um, and then you just click the link, and then you go to the website, and then you can read the stuff from there. It's just much easier to do than either scrolling on Twitter or um, going to the Birmingham Live website direct and trying to find it from there because I'm, I'm aware that's a bit of a hassle um so yeah it's kind of direct to your phone and it, don't worry you won't be like spammed you probably get i don't know three maybe four messages a day that sort of thing kind of spread out because you know obviously there's 
quite a few things that might go on on the Birmingham Live website, but um, it's basically just going to be my writing or, or analysis podcasts, uh, any news, that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, no spam. You, your details won't be shared to anybody. You won't be receiving text off other people in the chat because that isn't a thing. It's literally as Dan just seen, as Dan has just shown there. Um, just articles, basically three or four a day potentially. And yeah, and you can leave the group at any point as well. It's not like you're fixed in. And as I say, it's obviously free. It's for convenience, really, because as I say, we're, we're aware of how difficult it can be sometimes to kind of funnel through different things either on our website or on social media. So yeah, the direct to your phone. Um, yeah, hopefully you can join. Yeah, like the links in the description, all that pesky QR code is flowing back onto screen on John's face again. And I will leave it there for the next 10 seconds or so while I read the next question. So plenty of time to scan that QR code. Uh, you just sit there, John, with a QR code on your head. Uh, Kelvin says, I'd love to hear what you guys think about whether it might be the case that the constant worry and anguish over getting fourth place might be clouding what should be an absolute enjoyment of this season. It's likely to be that this season is the best war we'll have had in 25 years, yet every week seems to be spent agonising over will we won't we in regards to the Champions League I know it's important but let's not lose sight of how good things are and enjoy it does the panel agree let's get that QR code out of the way John what do you think are we stressing too much I don't know I just feel I'm uh, kind of worried about being hurt by it you know what I mean if, if we finish sixth and United get fifth that's just vile oh, yeah. of my life so um, yeah I'm just scared to get hurt by it so uh, I don't know it sounds a bit sad but that's the um, you know the reality if we were to get Champions League I'd we have gone the pit for like three months. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's so I can celebrate it then. Um, for me, it's like after the game, you can celebrate for a couple of days, which again, sounds really sad because I'm not a player and I'm not Emery. <laughs> but then I'm <laughs> focusing on Luton as of like Monday or Tuesday. So uh, yeah, then you're stressing up. Hopefully Pau Torres will be back. But for like one day afterwards, I kind of, yeah. But that's just me. I'm, you know, fans can do what they want. You know, I'd like to think that they're all enjoying it a lot. I'm only giving my opinion. So hmm. sorry downbeat um but yeah that's just how i feel about it it's um it's been a remarkable season and it's you know as a reporter you know kind of a dream first season for me uh, as like a professional so um it's like a memory i'll never forget in terms of the first campaign the pre-season for me in america was just like, one of the best things i've ever done in my life so like don't worry i'm i'm enjoying it but uh in terms of game to game in terms of like looking at what we can do and stuff that i also enjoy that side of it and you know, kind of, I always say before, if you're anxious about it or you're stressing or you feel like the last 20 minutes of a game, you're like, you're suffering about it, it just makes it sweeter at the end of it as well. So, mm, like, yeah. I'm, I'm not bothered that I'm not, you know, enjoying every moment of the season, if that makes sense. Like, the you, defeats to United were crushing, like, they were cruel, they were horrible. But then at the end of the season, if we finish above them, it, you know, it almost makes it feel better in a weird way. Because it's like, okay, well, you're you six points yeah. and you still can yeah. finish above us. Yeah, like, we have the last laugh and... As I said earlier, we've still got to do like six out of 12 wins, which I'm thinking, okay, can we? Yeah, I think we can. But yeah, I've kind of left myself with, I just want to enjoy it at the end of the season. And uh, well, I'm enjoying it through this season. Of course I am. Um, I'm speaking a lot about myself here, Dan. So. No, that's fine. I've asked you the question. You, I only want you to share your opinion. I agree. Like, yes, we should take, kind of take stock every so often and, and enjoy what we're seeing. Like, yeah, we can nitpick over. Forest cuts open a couple of times and they could have got back into it but they didn't and we won 4-2 and that's great we've won back-to-back -back games we've won at home after losing for a couple enjoy that moment look ahead to Luton and, and hopefully win that and continue that, that positive momentum Should we talk a little bit about the research for want of a better word that you did into Una Emery's match cycles oh this sounds so technical um <laughs> it is but it isn't so last yeah. week when we were talking about villa need seven wins from 13 <laughs> yeah, to yeah. get 70 points obviously we've got a win against forest so it's now six from 12 you looked into a 13 game cycle of una Emery's games to work out generally how many points he gets from those games or how many wins he gets from those games and my understanding of this when you first started to tell me about it again probably on a 2 a.m voice note was like game one to 13 was a cycle and then 14 to 27 was a cycle and then 28 to whatever the maths is is a cycle yeah. but again you can explain in a second but you mean one to 13 two to 14 three to 15 those cycles, Unaimer has never not won seven games in those chunks. Is that, is that correct? Let me just check. <laughs> <laughs> as I say, last weekend it was the case of, as you say, Dan, seven wins out of 13. I think that would be 21. Um, sorry, it would get us to 71 points, uh, which, you know, is 
very likely to get it uh, top four, top five, whatever it may be. Each 13 game cycle in terms of, so his first game against United, so the 13 games or the 12 games following that second game to the um, 14th game, et cetera, et cetera, all the way until last weekend, kind of doing it both ways as well. So United all the way down and then from uh, the Fulham game all the way up to the United game, if that makes sense. So all I did was just count 13, how many wins? <laughs> yeah. So it didn't take too long. Yeah. We haven't not won less than seven games. So put it this way, if we were to not get 71 points between now and the end of the season, it would be the first time in Unai Emery's reign, in, in Unai Emery's reign that we don't win seven games out of 13, which would obviously yeah. be, you know, uh, sad <laughs> because that would be, you know, we've done something that we've never done before at the very point in time which we need to do it. <laughs> So that was my kind of takeaway of like, you know, we can definitely do this because we've done it in every 13 game cycle. I don't know how many cycles that would be. My maths really isn't that good. I think there was one occasion where we won just seven out of 13 or it was like the amount of points equal to maybe it was less than seven wins, but we still got the amount of points based on yeah. like yours. Uh, so, yeah, that's the kind of, again, another confidence boost, positive, positive town for once. So the data suggests that in a run of 12 to 13 games, which is what we have left, we have always, always, got, been the here, always got that amount of points. So yeah, to suggest yeah. now that we're not going to get that would take a drop-off in form that we've never seen under Emery. Yes, so why are we all going, oh, we're not going to do it, they're going to overtake us. Evidence suggests we will do that again. You can look on how many points we get per game. So two points per game puts us on, I think, 76 points, I think, which I believe would be... A record for us in the Premier League based on points per game that's you know we will get above 70 points based on the 13 game cycles I don't know how many there would be don't know 20 maybe not sure the evidence on that would suggest that we'll definitely get 70 points so everything suggests 70 points or more but now it's just doing it and it's going to Luton and winning and it's going to West Ham and winning and not dropping points and hoping United drop more points it, oh, those do it, John. Let's, not, let's not look at game by game we're going to no, do it uh, I know no, we, we can, we can have, this is the point, we can do it, now let's God, do, it. do it. <laughs> exactly. yeah. uh, there's a, a, not a question here, but a comment more so from, from Matt. Uh, we've got a couple of questions left. He said, if Dan's score predictions have come true throughout the season, would Villa be on course to beat the all-time Premier League points, tally? So obviously yeah. in our preview show, we do a prediction every single week. Now, I always look at the games in isolation that I pretty much always predict Villa to win because I, I think we can beat basically everybody. So before we started, I had a look. I look through the spreadsheet I keep of predictions. Throughout the season, I predict us to lose one game, which was against Man City at home, which we won. <laughs> and I predict us to draw at Anfield away, which we lost. Yeah. In every other game this season, I've predicted Villa to win. So based off my predictions, I've predicted Villa to be on 73 points at this stage of the season, 26 games, which would see us 13 points clear at the top. If my <laughs> prediction came in, we'd be 13 points ahead of Liverpool in second place. I mean, I've probably done similar. Um, I mean, you are right. It's every game we are going into thinking we can win. The one that I did question at the start of the season was Newcastle. I think you said we would have won that game. I don't know what the score prediction was, but that, for me, was like mm. a... I mean, Newcastle were really on it this season, but they had, you know, the kind of the full-strength team... Uh, they had Tenali in there as well. First game of the season, it was going to be loud. We had a lot of changes, etc. Obviously, Mings, we didn't know about, but I didn't think we were going to win there. And when you said we were going to win, I thought, oh, Dan's fourth place prediction is, you know, he's miles off here. You know, he's been too, um, far too positive. And then, yeah, we are being too positive in terms of like 20 points clear or whatever it was. But <laughs> fourth place is doable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I was saying that in the summer. Everyone will remember in the Hockley Live show, and the room laughed at me, and I'll never forget that. And I can't wait to replay that moment at the end of the season when we actually do it. And you will, um, and I'll fuck you. That's what I deserve, mate. Uh, I won't do the points predictions for you because I'm doing it now. But just scanning through the document, it's colour coded, so it's easy to do. You predicted us to draw at Newcastle, draw at Liverpool, draw away at Chelsea, draw away at Wolves, uh, lose to Man City, same as me, draw away at Man United. Obviously, we lost sadly. Uh, draw at Man United at home as well. So you've never predicted Villa to lose, but you have predicted us to drop points on a few occasions. So your points to Ole would also be pretty massive. The penultimate question comes from JS, who says, which player, if any, do you think deserves more minutes? I think the use of deserves there probably skews the question. I don't think anyone deserves more minutes, to be honest. I think you could make an argument that maybe Diaby needs more time, or Zaniolo needs more time to make an impact. But 
I don't see an opportunity where we're kind of going, well, oh, give Diaby a go. Because at the well, moment, yeah. the current starting eleven is still winning games. So that that's the point. You, if you flip it, it's who does it, who doesn't deserve to be in the eleven? And yeah, no one. So uh, yeah, you know, no one on the bench deserves to be starting because they don't deserve to be playing above the player who, would, who they'd be replacing. Uh, I think Diaby Diaby's an interesting one this season because um, I don't doubt he probably thought he'd be you know one of the main players in the team, and I think we all thought that, and that hasn't transpired, but. I'm I'm okay because you know as Emery said as well he's he's not in a rush to mm. you know force the RB into a situation where he has to be doing this in at this point in a season or this year or whatever you know we've seen Bailey's like the perfect example and I think that probably helps everybody including Villa fans to say oh DRB isn't this or is not that well look at Bailey you know hopefully DRB will, will take less time than Bailey to adapt and whatever but that's kind of like a situation now where we don't have to kind of pin in any blame on anybody because the RB isn't particularly doing too well um, because he'll become, you know, he'll, he'll become um, used to playing Premier League games and affecting them in different ways. So I, I have no concerns over it, but don't get me wrong. It does help that obviously Bailey is playing to the level he is. It means that we don't have to worry about the RB. Football change quickly and we know this better than any other set of fans. I think Bailey could get an injury and be out for five games and it's the RB's chance to come in and do his yeah. business. So, um, and by the way, some <laughs> some players to bring off the bench. Really, you know, they're obviously a top top player. He's just uh, yeah a bit out of confidence at the moment. But as I say, that's all right. He'll have Conference League games as well to have an impact in. I think Zaniolo can still make an impact in the season. Um, Emery said something to do with you know he didn't say he trains very well, but not so much in games. That that isn't what he said at all. It kind of inferred. Uh, in a press conference saying that we'll need players like Diaby, et cetera, et cetera. Zaniolo, who's been training very well, kind of didn't say the rest of it, but we all know what that means. It's, you know, mm. you need to show it in games. Um, we are down to our bare bones, really. But come the conference quarterfinals, if we can beat Ajax, hopefully we'd have, um, you know, Conce Carlos back, uh, Duran as well. We forget Duran's on our books. I think it's some sometimes he's been out for a period of time now. So, yeah, all of a sudden, then we will hopefully have a team that's ready to kind of attack the last part of the season. Um, and those players will be able to stake their claim for more minutes because there'll be more opportunities, I think, you know, in, at the moment, the Premier League, because we haven't had too many games at the moment that will change with Ajax, uh, Luton and Tottenham coming up from West Ham. Yeah, right now, I don't think anyone deserves to be playing over anybody else from the bench. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've said before when we were asked about Diaby a few weeks ago that my answer was that he will still contribute. There's still a lot of time to, to make an impact. It, we'll look back in the summer and go that he scored the winner against Ajax or comes on and influences the game against West Ham and it's a tricky game and he helped us get a crucial three points. There's still plenty of time for him to contribute and you, you will do that. Um, it's just we are fortunate, you're right, that we're not going, God, the first team's not really doing it and the guy on the bench who we signed for 40-odd million, he's not doing it either, we're in trouble. The first team's doing great, he will have his moments. Calmness is, is the approach to that. There's no, no stress at all. The final question comes from Adrian, who says, and this is something I've thought about a lot, but we haven't really ever spoken about it. Attacking the whole end in the first half, have you got any stats? It seems we do better when this happens. Now, that was my feeling. I haven't looked at any of these stats yet. I know that you've done a bit of uh, homework again. I'll come to you in a sec. My feeling would be that when this happens in the stadium, and this is probably more recent thing than anything, obviously it happened against Nottingham Forest, and it's met with kind of boos and groans of, oh, God, oh. <laughs> I hate it when this happens. My dad says it every time. I hate it when this happens. Yeah, it's same, same. Sure, but everyone does it, right? I've always been like, okay, we have to kick <laughs> both ends during this game anyway. Like, I get it's like the advantage of the Holton will suck the ball in in the second half or whatever. Yeah. Why can the Holton not suck the ball in in the first half and give us a 3 0 lead half time, <laughs> which is where we were heading yesterday? I've always felt like, and again, this will be based off the fact that in the last 12 months, we've pretty much won at Villa Park every week anyway. And this will have happened. X amount of times in the last 12 months and we've gone on to win. So my feeling towards it is it doesn't matter because it feels like we go on to do well. well. Why is that met with groans and boos and, and moans? Why is that a thing that people go, oh, I don't like it when this happens? I think it's because it's it, obviously a psychological thing of, well, if we need a goal in the last 20 minutes, you'd rather be kicking at the whole end. And yeah, I suppose. End, which, I, don't, I don't know whether the, would the players just, think about that. Probably because... You would want that back in because as the opponent, if you're the opponent, sorry, you wouldn't want to feel that and face that noise. What I would say is I don't have the stats in terms of how many late goals have we scored at the whole end, but I've got the the opposite of how many early goals we've scored at the whole end. So one, two, three, four, five. So 
since Emery took over in six games, six home games, we've scored goals within the first 15 minutes. Um, so if I kind of run you, run you through them. So Brentford, uh, in fact, this wasn't Emery's first game, but <laughs> it kind of ruined it already. Brentford, you'll remember the Brentford game, three goals in 15 minutes. So yeah. uh, that was Aaron Danks' game. So the one after Steven Gerrard, but that, it doesn't matter that Emery's the manager or not. It's the effect of the whole end. So I've started a, um, in the Brentford game last season. Three goals in 15 minutes there. Emery's first game, which was United, uh, the week after, I think. Um, two goals in 11 minutes. And then mm. you have the game against Leeds when we won 2-1. Bailey scored in the first three minutes. Newcastle, the 3-0 win. Ramsey scored in 11 minutes. And then this season, McGinn scored in seven minutes of the whole end. And obviously Watkins yesterday, four minutes. I think that is quite a big sample, really, in terms of early goals. Um, and in some of those cases, there's two or three in the first 15 minutes as well. So mm. I do think it's it, it, we we definitely get an advantage from when we start, um, when we face the whole end of the first half. Again, I don't know what it's like going the other way. I can't remember too many late late goals. I mean, the Palace game, you know, we scored three. So it's, I don't know, that's potentially difficult to kind of say the whole end of that because... For me, it was just John Duran coming up with one of the goals of the season. Yeah. Um, Zaniolo scored against Sheffield United late on. So, um, yeah, there'll be cases like for both sides. But to mm. answer the question, there, there are quite a lot of goals when we score. Uh, sorry, when we face the whole end first. Because as I say, that's uh, six games since Brentford. So since round about when Emery joined. Um, six games where we've scored early in a few times, a few goals. So, yeah. And again, it's not every home game that we face the whole end is it? it's in fact quite rare so yeah definitely food for thought and um i think there was chatter uh, maybe last season that i think martinez or someone maybe might have flipped us kind of played in front of the whole end first as a um kind of you know he wanted to do that i don't know if that was true there was talk of john terry doing it when he was here that he wanted to face the whole end first there is, oh, okay. there's, yeah. there's two things for, for me here then obviously you set up you don't like this at all, do you? No, you set up the right way around that we attack the hole in the second half. Yeah. And when it flips, I think you've got that kind of like psychological thing that you then get to, when the Nottingham Forest team have to swap, and the goalkeeper has to run the length of the pitch, it gets pelters from the whole end. Like, as a psychological start to a game, I'd be thinking, let's unsettle that opposition goalkeeper. He's running towards us. Like, yeah. he's got to play behind us now. Yeah. We're scoring early goals against the Holton in the first half. You've got to play both ends anyway. Like, it's not like there's a massive slope on the pitch either way or anything. So, again, I feel like it doesn't matter. But also, like, use that as an opportunity. Like, this kind of like, oh, swapped ends. Like, it doesn't matter. We've got to play both ends anyway. And use that as momentum and fuel to go, let's have a go at the opposition goalkeeper and unsettle him early doors. Be 2 up in the first 15 minutes rather than nil nil. And we need a goal in the last twenty minutes. Yeah, no, he'll game early. Yeah, it could. It could be. A, I might actually ask Emery about that. In fact, I'm going to write that down. That is a, probably a decent question, or maybe just hint. So, is that something <laughs> to do? You know, are you aware of the stat? <laughs> did you watch the <laughs> podcast? <laughs> just stay until the last aware of the research. Yeah, did you stay until the last five minutes of the hour, hour long episode? We talk. We talk about a lot about marginal gains, don't we? So, if that is one that, that can be gained, that the Nottingham Forest team are set up with the North stand behind them, and then Martinez as captain or McGinn or whoever it is says, "Now let's flip it." And they've got to trudge all the way to the other end and get pelters from the whole end, and then Villa go on to score in the first three or four minutes. Use that momentum and get the crowd I mean, going. I, I'd be doing that as a thing. I don't know this stat exactly, but it's kind of like um, well known that in the Premier League, if you score the first goal, you've got a high probability of at least during the game. You know, usually if you're at home, you win the game if you score the first goal. Mm. Uh, especially because Villa are better than most teams in the Premier League. If we get the first goal at home, the odds are that we go on to win the match. There is that element as well. Well, let's just go for the first goal and give everything to score it in the first half. And then the second half is just, I don't say easier, but you've got the advantage then, as you say, Dan, you know, yeah. sort of like a, I don't know, maybe it's like a mentality thing of we weren't, I know we, it's always been a thing of we kick towards the whole in the second half, but maybe in the last like 10 years when we just weren't very good, um, we almost didn't expect to score the first goal. So it was like, well, if we need to win in the last 20 minutes, we'll attack the whole end because that <laughs> might, you know, might give us a better chance. Whereas now it's like, we can just beat a team in the first half or yeah. no, that's too extreme. But, no, we but can, effectively, yeah. You know, we were freeing up against Forest and we kind of messed it up for ourselves. But we can effectively go some way to winning a match within the first 25 minutes of a game if we're on form. So you're right. Why don't we play in front of the whole end and try and get that goal, all those goals that will put us in a really good position? And then 
kicking in into the north stand uh no not hopefully not into the north stand towards the north stand in the second half when you'd then be on like a counter-attacking situation because you've got your goal already you know the whole mm-hmm. game seems easier yeah. so I'm, I'm with you to be fair you kind of won me over um on that one get in well andrew asked i think andrew deserves a quote here um I andrew. adrian adrian Fair sorry enough. sorry adrian <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. My lucky John. Uh, one nil to me. Right, we'll call it a day there. Thank you very much, John, for joining me on Sunday morning to do this podcast. This is obviously our main Monday show for the week. The reason we're doing this today on our day off uh, is that we are filming an interview with... Uh, can I announce it now? No, I will not announce it now. If you follow us on Twitter, at Claret Blue Pod, this afternoon, Monday, there will be an announcement of who we've interviewed for the show, and that episode will be out on Wednesday. That's the plan. It's a former Villa favourite in Matt Kendrick's word. I'll give a bit more of a hint because it is that it's just coming out today. It's a manager and it's not Dean Smith. Uh, so there's your clues. Uh, but it will be a great episode, so come back for that. And we'll be back later in the week as well with our preview for Luton. A huge game, as we've spoken about in this episode. Uh, John, thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone, for watching along every week. As always, we appreciate all your support. If you're listening, uh, we appreciate you too. Leave a rating and a review. And get involved with the show. We uh, thoroughly appreciate everyone tuning in every week. We'll see you on Wednesday for our big interview. Uh, so stay subscribed to Current Blue, and we'll see you then. Hold up. 